I hope you are enjoying your summer. I know it's a weird summer. I know it's not what you expected, not what you would have hoped for, but I hope you're finding time to chill, you know, to just relax and enjoy some time with your family and most of all, some time with God. We meet every morning on Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. That's our, that's our first actual meeting time. And um, here at Good Hope, <clears throat> Pastor Ori led us in a devotion and he made everybody uh, just be quiet and say nothing and close their eyes. And he said, okay, everybody just, just think about Jesus or something like that. And he just went, And he did it for what felt like 30 minutes. It was about 10 seconds, you know, because we're not comfortable without moving and saying and doing, right? It's just become a part of our nature and a part of our culture. And it reminded me how valuable it is for you to have chill time, you know, just time with God, time with your family. I hope you've done that this summer. I hope you'll give yourself a break, get along with. By the way, if chill time for you is that you've been keeping your kids at home since March, you need some chill time without your kids. Can I get an amen? You might want to take my kid home right now. You can have him. You can just take him right now because that's not chill time. Well, we did have some fun this summer. My, my family and I, we went fishing. I'm, I'm going to talk about a boat trip today from Mark chapter 4. All right, a boat trip. While you're getting ready for that, let me tell you about a boat trip from two weeks ago. My family went down uh, for a, about 20 years. I've been doing deep sea fishing every summer. Love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Go out with a friend a lot. And so we went down and we caught some big fish. I've got some pictures of our big fish just in case you didn't think we, look, Bryant, Bryant caught that fish. Good job for Bryant. Uh, big old uh, amberjack right there. Um, so yeah, we just caught a slew of fish. That's one of our, one of our trips. And I just wanted to show you that in case you thought you were a better fisherman than me. Now, you know, but we, we, we had a lot, of, we had a lot of fun and we caught a lot of fish. But one of those trips, we were about 62 miles out from the Gulf, out in the Gulf of Mexico and, uh, with a very experienced c- captain. And this guy knows where all the fishing holes are. He knew right where to put us. And there was a lot of storms brewing in different places in the Gulf, but he knew how to avoid them all. And, you know, we ended up in this great spot, and we were just catching them as fast as we can drop our line, just in, 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 one, one fish after another. What I didn't notice is two huge thunderheads to the east and the west of us. And we're just kind of right in the middle. It's not raining. We don't see anything happening. It's kind of overcast. And, and just as we pulled up the last fish and we limited out for the day, those two thunderheads just like closed in on us. This big, massive, very scary thunderstorm. I'm talking waves and wind and rain pelting and, and lightning. It seemed like right on the other side of the boat. And so we're freaking out. And I, I noticed the, the captain, he said, throw everything in the bottom of the boat, squat down, h- hang on to something. He put it on uh, the compass on 600, uh, uh, 360 degree north, a uh, straight north. And he, he put the throttle down on all three engines wide open. And I thought, well, this is going to be a fun ride. You know, we're going to be jumping waves. It's going to be a story to tell about. Then he did this, which I've never, all my 20 years being out there with boat captains, I've never seen one do this. He did this. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I know he was calling on God because I asked him later. And that's when I realized we might be in trouble. <laughs> this guy's been a 30-year uh, captain in the Gulf of Mexico, and he has not, he's not even watching where we're going right now. He is crying. I mean, it wasn't like, now nah, let me, it, like he was on it for a while. I was like, do I need to take the wheel? I mean, it was serious. Well, we made it home. We all prayed, by the way. Like everybody saw that, and everybody just went into their own prayer closet right then. You know, I got, I got a prayer through. If your prayer life's struggling, just go out in the middle of the ocean. A uh, little life, uh, life and death situation will get you caught right back up, all right, with your prayer. But we made it home. Now, the story I want to tell you about today is w- way worse than that. It's on the Sea of Galilee. And I've been to the Sea of Galilee. It's the most beautiful water. Uh, for a big piece of water I've ever seen. It's just gorgeous. It sits in the middle of a valley in Israel, and there are mountains all the way around it, and it is 680 feet below sea level. So it, it makes for some really weird weather patterns. You think you're kind of like in a hole, and you can't see out of it. You don't know what's coming over the next horizon, and they didn't have the weather app back then. And so they got caught in the middle of something they weren't expecting. Let's go read about it real quick. I'm just going to read you a few verses and tell you the rest of the story as we go. Mark 4 and 35, it says, That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go to the other side. Now they're doing ministry on one side of the sea. They're going to go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took 
Jesus along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up. That, that's like a hurricane with no warning, just, just out of nowhere. <clears throat> and the waves broke over the boat. So waves are coming into the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Let me stop right there just for a minute. And you've got career, lifetime uh, seamen, fishermen on this sea that are afraid for their life. This is a serious bad situation. It's coming out of nowhere. They're wondering, this may be the last time I, uh, yeah, I may not see the land again. I, I may never see my family again. And then I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, maybe they were thinking this, why isn't Jesus doing something? I mean, if he is the son of God and, and he can do anything, wouldn't this be so, sort of something that, that should be happening right now? And it, it, it bears to mind the reality that when you give your life to Jesus, it does not ensure smooth sailing for the rest of your life. Did, did you know that? That like following Jesus doesn't mean everything's going to be cool now. Everything's going to be perfect in my life. In fact, sometimes it can mean the opposite because now you've become a threat to the plans of Satan. Now, we all know God has a plan for our life. Did you know Satan also has plans? Very clear in Scripture, he's a schemer. The Bible says he uh, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That he likes to kill, steal, and destroy. That he is your adversary. So, so he's got plans to, to, to destroy your family. He's got plans to keep you in a generational curse. That means your family does the same bad things generation after generation, same addictions, same uh, bad habits, same bad actions, the same poverty. Everybody's been in the same place for generations. That's Satan's plan. That's the way he likes to have it. But when you come to know Jesus, you have tied into a source that can change everything. Can I hear an amen to that? I mean, it's nothing he can't do. I mean, he can turn a family that's been going in the wrong direction for generations on a dime in 180 degrees back to where he wants you to go. And when you come to follow Jesus, you become a threat to Satan's plans. And so storms are going to often come up in your life, even as a follower of Christ. Stop for a minute before we get into this story very far and, and ask yourself, like, what are the storms in my life? Maybe you're facing a storm, you're a student, a teenager, big decisions about who you're supposed to be dating, who you're supposed to marry, am I supposed to go to college here, should this be my major? You look around and a lot of people around you don't think that's a big deal, but in your heart it is a big deal and it's a storm. Maybe you're married and got kids and those kids are a storm. <laughs> you've been praying and you've been leading and they're rebelling. Maybe it's a medical storm. And, and it's a problem that, that is completely out of your hands because you can't heal somebody. It's someone you love. Maybe it's a financial storm. Maybe it's a storm at work. And all these things can come up at a moment's notice. And I want to sh show you what this story teaches us about storms and Jesus. I'm going to tell you three things to remember when you're in a storm. And let me start with verse 35. It tells the first one. This day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Who's idea was it to get in the boat? I just showed you. Whose idea was it? Jesus. Jesus's idea. So write this down. You're in the storm by his appointment. There's an appointment there. Now, it doesn't say that he made the storm happen or he wanted them to be in the storm, but it's very clear he knows it's out there. He's going to get them through it. So you need to know the same thing about your storm. There is an appointment that God has for you. And, and in fact, these guys are not in the storm because they were out of the will of God. They're in the storm because they were in the will of God. And that brings up the question, where do storms come from? Three places real quick. Write this down. First of all, storms come from bad decisions. That's the easiest one for us to, uh, to realize. You ever been in a storm, like a big mess that you're having to deal with, and you created the mess? Can I hear an Amen. I've, I've, I've done that. You said something you shouldn't have said, done something you shouldn't have done, been a place you know you had no, I, no business being in that place, right? That's your storm. That's the first place. The second place is storms from the enemy because you are, the Bible says us that you are the apple of God's eye. That means you're the center point of his creation and he loves you like he loves nothing else. I, I, listen, I love nature. I love animals, but let me make it very clear. God loves you more than he loves trees. He loves you more than he loves dogs and cats and, and, and deer and, and, and livestock. You're the top of the list. And so the enemy has you as a target because of that. The Bible's very replete with that. And then the third area is just storms from a broken world. It's just 
just a broken world. There's stuff. Junk happens in your life because you live on this planet. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome this world. He says, listen, I'm the savior. I'm the solution, but you're going to go through some stuff. And you know what? I've been knowing that verse a long time. I've been preaching it for a long time. Never did I think the year 2020 was going to change that verse completely for me. But man, when he goes in this world, you'll have trouble. You're like, yup, 2020. Who would have thought this happens? Who would have considered you're going to be in this place that you're in right now? I'm right now preaching to people who look like you're either going into surgery or about to rob a bank. Who would have ever thought? I never thought this day would come, that this would happen. But God knew it. Jesus knew it 2,000 years ago when he wrote these words. Stuff is going to happen. It's going to surprise you. You're not going to be able to expect it. But take heart. I'm in there with you, and I have overcome the world. Can somebody praise him right now that he's here, and he's got this thing? So he knew it from the beginning. And he had a plan the whole way. And the storms may be painful and they may be very scary, but they're not outside of his purpose. He has a purpose for you in the storm. Second thing you realize, if you go to one more verse down in verse 38, it says, Jesus was in the stern, in the stern. Now, for you uh, land lovers, you may not know that the stern is in the back of the boat. That's the stern. The bow is the front. The stern is the back. The right side is the starboard side, and the left side is the port. And that's important because the, the, the Bible's going to tell you something else about Jesus in a minute. But right now, he's in the stern. So write this down. You're in the storm with his presence, and that's the best news you're going to ever get in your life. He's in the boat. Man, my boat's about to go down. It's taking on water. The, 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 side, the, the well, the, the hull is not deep enough. The water's coming over the side, but I still want to be in my boat because who's in the boat? Shout it out. Jesus. I, as, if Jesus is in the boat, this is the boat I want to get in. Now, what is Jesus doing in the stern or the back of the boat? Somebody tell me. Sleeping. Sleeping. Chilling. He's just, he's just chilling out. You're in the front of the boat freaking out. He's in the back of the boat chilling out. That, that's Jesus. Did it ever occur to you that Jesus, <laughs> let me say it like this, ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to Jesus? <laughs> Jesus never, read the whole Bible, never a moment does it say, you know what, Jesus never goes, you know what just occurred to me? Because nothing's ever occurred to him. He knew the end from the beginning, right? I'll tell you something else that's never happened to Jesus. He's never had an emergency meeting. He's never had like a, we got to get everything together. This is crazy. I don't know what to do. I mean, it's, it's been so weird. You know, we're a planning church because we feel like it, we should do everything with excellence. We should do it with purposeful excellence and reach as many people as we can. We have had more impromptu meetings about what we're going to do, how we're going to do this. Somebody asked me in the early service, you know, what we're going to do about this. And, and literally they were asking me, and, and I was literally thinking like, I know we've had two meetings about that and I have no idea what we're going to do about it. Because everything changes so rapidly and we're having this meeting and an impromptu phone call and an emergency meeting. I want to tell you with all certainty that when 2020 rolled around, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit didn't call an emergency meeting and say, what are we going to do about this? Man, there's a coronavirus. What's a corona? I don't even want to tell I promise you that Jesus didn't look over to the Father and say, now I'm hearing about murdering hornets. Did you create murdering hornets? Or is that a thing? They didn't have that meeting, y'all, because he knows the end from the beginning. And that's important because every promise in this book is not invalidated because it's 2020 or because of hornets or African dust or God help us, whatever's coming next. These promises are still true. God is still God. You're still his son. You're still his daughter. He's in control. <laughs> Nothing has changed. He's still God. He doesn't have emergency meetings. He doesn't freak out because he does, he's in the boat with you and he is taking a nap because he knows what's happening. And I want you to grasp this, that even when the winds are blowing and the waves are crashing and, and, and really scary things are in front of your eyes, the Savior is in your boat. The healer, when, you, when the doctor comes back and says, I don't, I don't really know how to tell you this, Whatever he says next doesn't change that the healer is in your boat with you. When you lose your job and you don't know what you're going to do when the unemployment runs out 
Did you know the, the God who owns the cattle of a thousand hills, the, the, the way maker, is in your boat? Don't forget that. I mean, there may be some really big things that you find out this week. Maybe last week you found out some really big things. You're never going to find out anything bigger than the fact that God is in your boat with you. And if you'll stay in the boat with him, you'll find out what, what David was saying in Psalm 23. King David said, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I have no fear. Why? Because you are with me. And, and, and in Hebrews, it says, even God says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end of the age. How far is the end of the age? I don't know, but you're not going to live to see it. <laughs> The end of the age is a long way out, and he's going to still be there with you. So listen, in your storm, he has an appointment for you there. You're supposed to be. There's a reason for that storm to be going down. He's there with you. Secondly, he, he, he is in the boat. He's not left you alone. And here's the last thing. I believe you are in your storm for his purpose. Well, what, what if I created my storm? That's the great thing about God. God shifts on the fly, like you've, you've made a mess, you've, you've ruined something, and God still says, okay, I'm going to use this for your good. You've messed up everything, and God goes, okay, I didn't want you here, this is a mess, but from here, here's some purpose for you. Isn't that great? Don't you try to do that? If you're a parent, you try to do that for your kids. <laughs> you've told them to go this way, they go that way. And, and you want to, you want to. okay, now what you have to do here is you have to do, but at least for a minute you want to go God just pivots and says, here's where you go now. If it was your mistake, if it was the enemy who attacked you, if it was just this world, in the middle of that storm, God is in real time saying, okay, here's what you do next. Now, the disciples were facing their greatest fear. Not a storm. They've been in a lot of storms. That was not their greatest fear. Their greatest fear was when they, they told you their greatest fear, when they said, Jesus, wake up. Don't you care that we're drowning? That's their greatest fear. Don't you care? That maybe Jesus didn't care. Actually, Jesus cared way more than they thought. He cared so much that he's not going to let them drown, but he's going to stretch them and he's going to test muscles that they have never exercised before. You see, because they went through the storm, they got to see the power of God. We keep reading in just a minute. We're going to get to where Jesus steps up and commands the winds and the waves to lay down flat. Commands the rain to stop falling. And the disciples go, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Stop for a minute. So I, I was thinking as we were singing that song just a minute ago in worship, what a powerful name, the name of Jesus. You have no rival. You have no equal. Nobody's even in competition with you. And, and, and right from my seat on the front row, I just I heard God say, this story you're about to tell people, it's not a nursery rhyme. It's not a, a fable. There's really a place. I've been there with a, with a big sea with, with torrential storms. And one time, there was really one boat with Jesus and some of his disciples and several other boats out there. And truly, every single person was about to die. All the boats were going to sink. There are many, many boats in the bottom of the Sea of Galilee to this day both ancient and modern boats because there is no way to overcome some of those storms. That was going down on that day. It really was happening. And Jesus really was asleep. And there really was a moment where he got up and he told the wind to stop blowing. And it stopped. 
And he told the waves to stop rising and they laid down flat. He told the rain to stop raining and it actually stopped raining. I'm telling you, that is not an encouraging story. It's not a fable or a parable meant to teach you a lesson. That actually happened. There were actual men who were near death and an actual savior of the world who loved them so much really forgave everything and, 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 and came in and healed that situation. That actually happened and that is the God you've sung to today that's the God you've sung about today and that's the God who has you in the center of his heart today and he said he said don't you care that we're about to die he cared so much he let them see his power that day and that show of power hooked them so they followed him everywhere he went and and they got to see his character they got to see how he loved the unlovable and how he lifted up the broken and he over just walked right past the people with money and authority and status and said you know what this other person matters just as much as you do and they got to see him die heroically and sacrificially they got to see that with their own eyes and they got to see him rise from the dead and they got so convinced that they gave their whole life to him. And they became the greatest men, at least some of the greatest men who ever lived. They would have never gotten there without this storm, without that thought, Jesus doesn't care about us. Jesus, maybe he's a fraud. Maybe this whole thing is not even real. Had, had they not gone to that place, they would have never become the greatest men who ever lived. What if God's looking at you like he looked at Peter that day? He, he chose Peter, a lying, cursing, anger-filled sailor. And he said, no, you're better than that, Peter. One day you're going to preach the gospel. The dead are going to rise the sick, the lame are going to walk just by your shadow being cast over them. And when they try to get you to deny Christ, you're going to be crucified upside down. I know how great you are. All they see is an angry, cursing, lying sailor. I see so much more, but I'm going to put you through some storms to get you to where you're going. That's what he's seeing right here. He's looking at you and he's saying, man, you're way more than you think you are. <laughs> you, yeah, you're a good person. You know you're good, but you are so much more than that. And I'm going to let you go through some storms. I'm going to let some stuff happen in your life, but I'm never going to leave you. See, he wants to build you. Everybody say build. build. Say build up. build up. He wants to build you up. When a storm happens, there's two things that has to happen. Because storms, you know, think of a hurricane. It tears down buildings and homes and equipment gets tossed around. Boats get sank in harbor and there has to be a removing. You've got to remove all the debris. But there's also got to be an improving. You got to make it better. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, it also, like the Sea of Galilee, is below sea level. And so they have these big levees designed to hold the water out from a storm surge. But the levees weren't big enough. They were designed for a Category 3 storm, and Katrina was a Category 5. So it went right over the levees, knocked them down, destroyed businesses, sank boats, washed uh, buildings out to sea. And what we wanted was a removing job. Remove all that junk. Remove all that debris. Clean up all that mess. And you know what? It occurs to me that when we're in a storm, we're asking for the same thing from God. Remove this. Get this problem out of my way. Fix this situation right here. Make that wind lay down. Make that wave go away. In storms, we want God to do a removing job, but He wants to do an improving job. He says, hey, I'm going to make you stronger because of this. I'm going to make you bigger because of this. I'm going, to, I'm going to build your faith muscles in ways you never thought were possible. You're going to get through this, and I'm going to stand up. And you know what? That's what he did for the disciples that day. That's why he was in the back of the boat. Now, if you read the rest of that story, you're going to hear that Jesus was in the stern of the boat. He was doing what? Shout it out. He was sleeping in the stern of the boat. But when he woke up, when they woke him up, he walks to the, what part of the boat? The bow. The bow's in where? It's in the front of the boat. And he said, peace, be still. I think it was an image he wanted us to think about today. Maybe in your life, 
Y'all stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Maybe in your life, you're feeling like the disciples. They they have forgotten about Jesus. They're trying to stay alive. He's sleeping. I don't know when Jesus is going to show up. How many of you do that, right? I mean, I'm praying for Jesus to do this. And until Jesus does this, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to stay alive. I'm going to try to get my bills paid. I'm going to try to get this figured out. And I'm going to pray for Jesus to do something about it. And so they're just out in the front of the boat. They're fighting. They're working at it. They're doing everything they can. Meanwhile, Jesus is in the back of the boat. And then came that moment where from a a reclining position, he stood up in the back of the boat. They don't even see him moving. I mean, they're fighting, they're, they're struggling, they're trying to row or trying to get things under control. And right from the back of the boat, he walks to the front of the boat and he says three words that changes everything. He says, peace, be still. That image is in this story. This book is in your life because God wants you to know right now if it's a medical emergency, if it's an if a, a, a emergency of heart or spirit, you don't know what you're going to do about your finances maybe. Maybe there's decisions that are rocking your world right now and you're saying, where's God in all this? Why isn't God doing anything? I don't know the solution to your problem, but I know this. If you don't get out of the boat, if you keep Jesus in your boat, you just keep reading this book. You just keep lifting those hands. You keep singing and worshiping. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to work at it. You're going to pray. You're going to fight. You're going to do your all. And just out of nowhere, when you think you're going to go down, he's going to stand up on the back of your boat. He's going to walk right through everything you've tried to do. And on the front, he's going to say, peace and settle everything because he cannot lie and he cannot change. Did you know God can do anything but lie? Cannot lie and he cannot change. If he did it for them, he's going to do it for you.